get started. Um, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Michela Baldo, um, who is our first guest lecturer uh, for the cycle of seminars of English studies. Um, and she's a lecturer in translation studies at the University of Birmingham. And her research revolves around two strands. And one is the written and audiovisual translation of into Italian of Italian Canadian works. And on this topic, she has written a book entitled Italian Canadian Narratives of Return, Analyzing Cultural Translation in Diasporic Writing, and it was published in 2019. And as a recipient of the Emilio Goggio Research Fellowship, she is now collaborating on a research project on Italian Canadian queer artists based at the Franco Iacobucci Center of the University of Toronto with Dr. Paolo Frasca, yes. who will be our guest speaker in, uh, at the end of April. Um, her second strand of research concerns the role of translation in Italian queer trans feminist activism. And on this topic, she's published several articles and she has co edited a special issue of translation and interpreting studies. It's a quite a recent publication on translation and LGBT LGBTQ activism and of perspectives on translating queer popular culture. She has also co-translated into English with Elena Basile, the book Queer Theories, written by Lorenzo Bernini. And she has also co-translated into Italian an anthology of writing by Sara Ahmed, which is forthcoming very soon, I hope, yeah, this year. So um, join me in thanking and welcoming uh, Dr. Baldo for being here today. We're very happy to have you here. And your lesson today is on translating queer feminist language, some Italian scenarios. So the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Silvia, for uh, this invitation. Uh, as for me, uh, I wanted just to um, say that uh, I spent a year, years ago, in Siena from the year 2012 till the year 2013. So it's nice to, to be back. And uh, I was kind of uh, uh, moved as well when I arrived yesterday. So a lot of memories of, uh, of Siena from 10 years ago now. And um, as, uh, as what concerns me, just uh, to give you a background about my formation, I uh, have a background in linguistics and uh, uh, in translation studies mainly, and gender and sexuality uh, studies. So I combine all this uh, uh, kind of expertise today uh, in this talk because I will give you a bit of an introduction about uh, queer linguistics, what we mean by queer linguistics, queer feminist language. And then I will also uh, give you a bit of elements of uh, translation studies. I know Sylvia mentioned that uh, you've uh, uh, done a bit of strategies in translation studies theory, so I won't bother you with theories, but I will give you some elements that will uh, enable you to look at examples of uh, translated uh, uh, language from Anglophone uh, queer works um, translated into Italian. So uh, I'll provide examples that uh, can be put into context if I give you also a bit of a, an understanding of what we mean by feminist and queer translation uh, projects. So uh, for, um, for what concerns now the presentation, I'm going to share my screen and also for those who are online. So I prepare a PowerPoint. So. Uh, the presentation, as Silvia mentioned, is called Translating Queer Feminist Language, Some Italian Scenarios. So I'm going to start with uh, Italian scenarios. Uh, if there are things not clear, maybe we can uh, devote a bit of time, depending how much uh, time we'll be able to say for the end, for comments and questions, okay? So uh, if you have anything that you haven't understood, I try to explain as I, as I go concept that might be a bit uh, um, uh, difficult. So I'm gonna start with giving you, uh, giving you a bit of the scenario of Italian transfeminism, because this is the topic of my research, uh, um, at least it has been for the last 10 years. So uh, what do we mean by Italian transfeminism? 
so uh, or queer trans feminism as well uh, this is a, a form of feminism uh, and I'm talking about this now because the groups of translators I'm going to mention later and the examples of translations come from translators who kind of circulate around these groups or uh, define themselves as trans feminists. So it's important to also start giving you definitions about what trans feminism is. It's a word that has started circulating as well also more widely in the last years. So uh, it's, uh, it's a word that started circulating according to Raquel Borghi from 2010 for the Cinque Giornate Lesbiche um, in Rome, uh, in which uh, the um, uh, transfeminism basically is a term that uh, uh, defines a type of feminism, which is uh, um, um, kind of including transgender politics. But rather than uh, including the word would be is based on uh, an epistemology uh, based on transgenderism. So it's not just, oh, we are feminists who are including also transgender people. It's rather trans feminist is based on a non naturalization of the concept of woman. So the subject of feminism in trans feminist is not um, uh, um, the kind of based on biology. So we also include the trans, transgender women, but mainly we, with that trans, we include a lot of other things. It's very intersectional form of feminism, which includes uh, kind of subjectivities that are left out from other type of feminism, because there are many type of feminisms, uh, as probably already you know, just, uh, just to give you an example. So um, it's basically a feminism that is informed by transgender politics, but also uh, the notion of queer, which I will explain in a bit. And uh, doesn't really um, um, left out uh, the idea of including you know, trans transgender women, but as I said, it's not just an inclusion, it's just starting from a different perspective. So uh, on top of intersectionality, uh, there is a lot of emphasis in this feminism on the notion of body. So on the embodiment, whatever we do is just, uh, we do it uh, with ourselves, we position ourselves in a specific place. And uh, uh, this feminist focus a lot on the body. So also the translation are very embodied. You, you're gonna probably understand a bit more later. What do I mean by embodied translation? But there is a presence of the body in all these translation scenarios in a way that uh, translate, translations are also used in workshops in which there is experimental uh, element with the body. So very embodied type of feminism. And it's very much strong in Italy at the moment, in Spain and in France. And I'm, I'm drawing from Espinera and Boursier. I've got a list of the references, which I will pass on to Sylvia at the end of the talk. So you can maybe, if you're interested in exploring more and reading, you can do that later. So uh, what are the um, queer trans feminist groups I refer to when I uh, talk about trans feminist translation, mainly uh, groups like Laboratorios Mascheramenti, which is a group born in Bologna, and you might have already heard about this group, um, which uh, started in 2008, just to unmask the notion of masculinity, just was to start to work about what is the toxic masculinity, dominant concept of masculinity, and works a lot with uh, concept of uh, queer feminism. And there is a word feminism very much at the center of this uh, group. So it's a queer group, but puts a lot of emphasis on the notion of patriarchy, challenging patriarchy and heteropatriarchy. So patriarchy, which is based on the compulsory heterosexuality. So, uh, so Movimento Nazionale is another one. I'm gonna look at the link, a couple of links later on to give you an example. Uh, so Movimento Nazionale brings together a lot of other transfeminist groups from all Italy that meet uh, sometimes at the Campeggia Transfeminista. I was, I was also taking part to uh, two of these in the past years. And so it's basically a network of various transfeminist groups in Italy. So just explore the page. It's not as active as it was in the past, but it's still very active. And in particular, Laboratorios Mascheramenti. 
uh, consultoria transfeminista queer are other initiatives that uh, put a lot of emphasis on the notion of health, queer health, and so another important, uh, some of the members of this uh, um, Groups have also translated, uh, Paul Preciado, for example, use it uh, as part of the workshop on the hormones, for example. And Camille Scholt is a group from Rome, which has inspired a lot of translations of transfeminist thought from Spain into, uh, into Italy. I won't talk about that because today I'm on, on, only focuses on Anglophone queer works, but just to give you an idea about, you know, transfeminist groups in Italy. And then, you know, all of you, I suppose, you know, Nonuna Di Meno, the famous uh, feminist movement. I don't know if I need to introduce Nonuna Di Meno, but it's a movement uh, uh, that was born in uh, Argentina in 2016. Actually, the premises was 2015 after a femicide. And 2016, there was a public manifestation in, in Buenos Aires. And after that, it has spread all over uh, Latin America, Italy, Spain, and, uh, and also in the UK where I am. I, I was part for a, for a period of Women's Strike Assembly, which is the, the English version of Nuno di Meno in the UK. Uh, so Nuno di Meno also defines itself as transfeminista. So you say shopper transfeminista is based on the notion of strike, transfeminist strike. So you see that the word now has been circulating a lot. What I didn't uh, fail to mention that is the work started circulated after the um, Transfeminine Manifesto was uh, um, uh, published by Amy Koyama in 2001. So there was this pivotal text, uh, Transfeminine Manifesto, which was then translated into Italian. I was part of the translation collective Le Beach that translated this manifesto in 2018 into Italian. So is the word that started circulating from 2010, let's say in Italy, also because of this manifesto published in 2001 about what transfeminism. So if you want to know about us, also Google Amy Koyama, and there is a manifesto about what, what transfeminism should be. So let's now move uh, into, uh, I hope Sylvia will make a sound about time because I don't have any, any uh, sign for time, but I continue. So a bit of understanding also of queer language. I know you've been taking classes on um, uh, linguistics, a bit of you know, uh, understanding of what language is. So I'm gonna start first of all, to uh, also give you an understanding of the term queer, because I don't know if you've been introduced to that. Some of you might, I see some nodding, some of you nodding, but. So uh, basically uh, queer, I'm gonna talk about queer linguistics, which draws a lot of insight from queer theory. So let's start defining queer theory. Um, so queer theory was born in the US, in the 90s, early 90s, um, we have a name like Teresa de Lauretis, which I don't have in the, the, the slide, but Teresa de Lauretis was um, the one who kind of popularized this word and then decided not to use it anymore, but this is the first person who just mentioned the word queer. So there was a moment at the beginning of the 90s in the US uh, with queer nation, for example, after the AIDS crisis, where uh, some groups uh, uh, started question the coherent the existence of a coherent gay and lesbian, lesbian subject. There was like a, a criticism of these uh, ideas of a coherent subjectivity, gay and lesbian, because uh, um, people with AIDS had been uh, um, um, treated in a derogative way, etc. So there's a group of radical. Uh, subjects who don't identify with these uh, categories and call themselves uh, uh, radical queer nation. There's a manifesto in the 90s. And basically in the, in the theory, in the academia, there is this uh, um, borrowing of the word that they, these people reclaim for themselves. So because the word queer was a slur, was a the derogative word, was an insulto. Um, so it would be probably translated as frocio in Italian now, uh, as that kind of um, uh, nuance of meaning, started basically um, 
testing uh, these uh, um, kind of coherent subjectivities and wanted to, uh, I'm talking about academia, but of course academia has kind of borrowed concept from activism, uh, wanted to uh, basically include into the category, expand that narrow categories to include people of color. There's a question of race very much strong also in the translation I'm gonna show you in a bit. Uh, poor people, also the, the concept of poverty, precarity, which is a very strong also uh, concerns of transfeminist uh, groups in Italy. They actually think we are queer and we are poor. So there's a question of uh, we can find jobs and, and also our subjectivity uh, has an impact on our, um, on our life, economically speaking. So uh, people of, uh, poor people, bisexual people, because uh, although there was that category in the acronym LGBT, that B always tended to be a bit excluded from, from the category. Polyamorous people, uh, there was a lot of emphasis in queer and gay and lesbian uh, politics on monog monogamy. And instead the queer people, um, they, they wanted to include also polyamorous people, people who have relationships that are non-monogamous, so with different uh, partners. Transgender people that you might know who I uh, refer to, so people who uh, don't identify with the, uh, the gender assigned at birth. And intersex people, intersex people, we mean people who have uh, um, um, sex characteristics that belong uh, both to the male and female spectrum uh, in terms of gonads, in terms of hormones, in terms of genitals, for example. So all these categories were excluded. So from the 70s and 80s politics of L, L and B, LG, I would say, uh, gay and lesbian um, uh, politics. So um, we are mentioned reclaim this slur for themselves. So academia has imported the term queer as a term that uh, um, both uh, kind of uh, include more subjectivity, so expands the remit of an inclusion of different subjectivities, uh, uh, including the ones I've just mentioned, but also as a term that uh, um, means is a critical, critical view of uh, what it means uh, um, understanding gender and sexuality. So it's, um, it's a term that is, has now, because it's had entered academia many years ago, has now been deprived of that uh, pejorative meaning. But uh, there are groups like those I've mentioned, Laboratorios Mascheramenti, which want to keep that and still, when translating from English into Italian, use that queer as it is or with um, next to it a word like froch, for example, just to, to uh, give, uh, give a sense of the, um, this lore again. So, um, uh, queer theory basically um, is a reconceptualization of dominant discourses, which shape our understandings of sex, gender, and sexuality. I draw from Jagos, but also Butler is one major name, Judy Butler. Uh, on, on the topic. So it's a conceptualizing the idea of sex and gender uh, and sexuality and, um, and looking at them uh, separately, but also linked in their linkage. And, uh, and in the fact that they are foundational of heteronormativity, heteronormativity. So this is the big word in this field. What does it mean heteronormativity? Is the norm that says that heterosexuality is what you know we should have. So it's the heterosexual norm. So a norm based on heterosexuality, heteronormativity. So uh, this is what Butler also uh, uh, challenges with their work um, on doing gender in 1990 and many others after. Uh, so it's, it's basically a system that constructs heterosexuality as normal, self-evident and preferable. Okay. So uh, queer theory wants to basically uh, um, throw a, a critical um, lens uh, around this concept, uh, the concept of normativity, in particular, focuses on the deconstruction of the gender and sex. 
sexual binarism is very much against the notion of binarism and therefore when I say also queer I intend also transgender in a sense in the same time but they also put together as, as terms so it's very much shying away from the category of binarism we can't really um, uh, conceive only two genders there are many genders are just male and female but also categories because a lot of sexual categories in lesbians based also on monolithic ideas of, uh, ideas of gender so also those categories might be um, you know questioned way so um, the second, uh, yeah and the second important uh, concept is uh, heteronormativity so a challenge of binarism and heteronormativity. This is what characterizes queer theory. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm clear, but I will come back to that in a, in a bit. So let's now move on with the queer linguistics. So queer linguistics is a branch of linguistics uh, that uh, draws from queer theory. Okay, it draws a lot of insights from queer theory. Is relatively a rather, a relatively young branch of linguistics, I would say. Um, uh, the, uh, yeah, I need to uh, move a bit this because I'm not sure if, uh, if you hear me. It was born more or less uh, around 2008, 2007 and 8, and uh, with some studies by Motion Barker, Koch, etc. And uh, it focuses on the linguistic construction on non-heterosexuality. So it looks at, for example, um, the speech of gay and lesbian, etc. But it's not really just focuses on that, on looking at language spoken by groups that identify with the, with the material umbrella. It's basically looking at uh, also hetero, uh, heterosexual uh, identities, basically throwing a look at sexuality in general and looking at uh, discourses that are based on heteronormativity. So it's not just a branch of linguistics that deals with queers, as we say, but deals with all, all notion of sexuality and gender, I would say, although sexuality has a very big focus, a very big component of queer linguistics. And also criticize, so it criticizes basically uh, heteronormativity, the norm, everything that is based on the norm, which means norm based on gender binaries, patriarchy, because there's a lot of focus also on feminism within queer theory, and norm based on heteronormativity, compulsory heterosexuality. So um, if you're a woman, you have to have certain characteristics and you, you're assumed to be straight and not uh, something else. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, studies of queer linguistics that looks um, that look at uh, um, discourses, mainstream discourses, and then criticizes them, not necessarily at you know uh, the language uh, spoken by gay communities or gay and lesbian communities, etc. So uh, it also criticizes uh, on the normativity is. Uh, uh, that normativity that is embodied by uh, gay, gay people, for example, uh, is mainly referred to gay and lesbian uh, groups. Uh, politics that doesn't context sufficiently heteronormativity, okay? So just understanding the notion of gay in a very restricted way and leaving away, for example, transgender people and, uh, and other, you know, their subjectivity as um, it happened in the past. As I said, the queer theory was, was against and it's still happening. So um, a concept coined by Dagan in 2002, and uh, it's very much uh, a debate for um, a concept that is uh, talked about. So uh, queer linguistics is a branch of critical discourse studies. So a reaction to essentialist, hegemonic, and naturalized notion of gender and sexuality. So it's, um, it basically uh, draws from post-structuralist studies of linguistics. I don't know if Sylvia has mentioned Derrida, has mentioned Foucault. So it's basically a criti um, critical, insight, a critical view of uh, these discourses. It draws on social linguistics in looking at also the specific speech of a certain community, and mainly on critical discourse analysis. 
So it draws is a very uh, is a theory that is very much based on criticizing the status quo and the power. So then the notion of power, like in Foucault or Derrida, is also present here. So it's a theory that is also drawing on post-structuralist feminist linguistics. And therefore, as I said, feminism is very much important part of this, uh, of this discourse. Yeah. Um, so there is a political aspect behind all that. So when we talk about queer linguistic, we don't talk about heteronormativity only, but heteropatriarchy in a sense. So there is also a feminist uh, consensus very much present and sexuality. So um, another important part of the linguistic is the fact that it doesn't simply criticize the status quo, but it tries to also come up with elements to subvert the status quo, this hegemonic notion of gender and sexuality. And this is exactly, exactly what is happening in these translations I'm going to show you. There is this idea of coming up with creative ways to forge new ways in which we can speak in a way that make a parody of heteronormative discourses, but at the same time propose new solutions and also a language which is more inclusive, that includes or that goes beyond gender binaries. So um, this is just um, a slide I had taken from a conference I went years ago from Ver Veronica Kohler, it's a very big name in queer linguistics. She talks a lot about the construction and uh, um, the speech of uh, uh, lesbian communities in, uh, various in, in Germany, both in the UK. And uh, uh, this was just a slide I wanted to show you because uh, Basically, there are groups uh, in linguistics, uh, uh, conferences, and uh, um, basically, yeah, two groups in conferences that are really striving, you know, the last 10 years, and then focuses on uh, queer linguistics. So these are, for example, the uh, Lavender Language Linguistics conferences that were born in the 90s. And I participated in one last year in Catania. So these are conferences are uh, yearly conferences. This year it was in uh, the US, but last year it was in Catania. And um, there is a lot of work done in the last years on sexuality that wasn't there, for example, 10 years ago. So there's a lot of emphasis on sexuality. Uh, again, like the language is still there. But I would say um, uh, sexuality, and uh, there is also a journal of language and sexuality that was born in 2012 as part of that, that basically follows uh, queer linguistic uh, actions. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to give you some example of queer language in Italian, although I translated this in English because I didn't know, you know, it was uh, at, the, at the talk, but just to give you an idea of what queer linguistic does to uh, throw a critical lens at uh, discourses, heteronormative discourses. What is heteronormativity in, um, in, a, textual, uh, in a textual sense? Um, this was a, a rape um, case that I was involved in the, in terms of uh, research years ago. So I was, I was thinking I'm going to bring it up because uh, it happened in Florence. We are here in Siena. And I wrote about that. I was really passionate about writing that uh, article. That uh, um, basically um, happened in 2008. And then in 2015, there was a sentence that uh, acquitted the, the uh, rapist. There's a, there's a woman, 23 years old, was raped at the Fortezza La Basso, the Basso in Florence. So uh, the acquittal sentence, I downloaded that, uh, I researched that, and I look at the language of this acquittal sentence to see why, what was the justification for uh, basically freeing this um, um, allegedly rapist. So uh, this, uh, um, uh, the text of the sentence was focusing on two main things, on the morality of the victim and on the idea of bise bisexuality, uh, bisexuality, sorry, and uh, on the idea of not having a linear life. So um, uh, there were words like uh, uh, this inhibit, eccentric, as she has an inhibited and eccentric character, aimed at attracting men's attention, exuberant and inhibited, 
uh, carotid of the injured party or didn't have a stable relationship, etc., etc. So there, there was the classic sexism. Okay, this woman is too free because she has also a relationship with women, so it's you know sexually free. So there's a, there's a, there's so called slut shaming. We call it in the, in in, uh, in English shaming the victim because she is uh, um, she's having a you know sexual life and uh, uh, so you know understanding her as a whore etc and then by the same time also uh, shaming her for her bisexuality the bi bisexuality and non-linear life which is the non-straight you know the non-straight pathway this is what queer theory and queer linguistics is interested the non-straight part made her unreliable as, as a witness. So the, uh, the bisexuality is linked to being unreliable when you witness and when you, you give a statement. So a fragile woman, but at the same time, creative disability. So there was a lot of confusing words also in the text. So if you analyze linguistically a text like that, you see um, it was, she was a fragile, but she was also very alert. She was actually drunk. The, the problem was that she was drunk. She, she had drank a lot, so she was not able to give consent. So um, she was not sober, but alert. She was a fragile, but she was also strong. There's this kind of uh, um, uh, contrastive use of adjectives referring to the idea of bisexuality what bisexuality bisexuality means is that we're not in a, in a cabinet patient is that i'm not here i'm not there and this is the common mainstream idea which is a normative idea about what bisexuality also is so you see that these elements are really important because an analysis like that uh, uh, can be understood as a queer uh, linguistic analysis and then there was this Caminata Romana that was uh, um, uh, organized in Rome uh, to, support, to support the case. Posso essere nudo o vestito, homo o eterosessuale, sobre o briaca, nessuna scusa. La violenza, violenza, nessuna scusa. There are other examples of uh, um, heteronormative language. I don't know how much time. We don't, I don't have a... Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll go. Yes. <laughs> So these are examples a bit uh, outdated, but I'll provide more uh, current examples. But I thought, you know, there is still the idea now of the stepchild adoptions that then came up, the filiation europea, etc. So I brought also all the examples that I had analyzed as part of the paper on Fortezza da Basso. So, for example, uh, the politician Alfano on the removal of the stepchild adoption in, um, um, years ago from same-sex couples um, partnership says, we are able to prevent, we were able to prevent an anthropological revolution against nature. So against nature, what is nature? This is normativity. This, this is what a queer linguistic analysis would bring up. This is uh, what heteronormativity shows up in language. And the minister of family Fontana, that was not minister of family anymore now, unfortunately, has gone up. And the family is composed by the same-sex same couple, don't exist. So even, you know, um, kind of negating, you know, there's only heterosexuality, compulsory heterosexuality, something that Butler had mentioned and said. But then we said the queer linguistic is also interested in bringing and challenges the status quo. So the groups I mentioned, and they do so also by translating, they bring a lot of new uh, kind of exam, a lot of uh, um, uh, strategies to challenge this heteronormativity. So as you are familiar now, debates have been uh, ongoing with the use of a new uh, inclusive language. So for example, the asterisk uh, used at the end of words, at the end of um, nouns and other words inside the participants, etc., uh, to uh, basically signal, uh, to, uh, to, to be able to avoid the signaling of binarism, because in Italian, uh, Italian grammar, we have only the male or female. We don't have also um, a pronoun that is inclusive, like in English, we have the day. 
plus in English, the language uh, avoids um, um, signaling the gender. Uh, so it's, it's a different construction, as you know. So I'm not, not just going into that because certainly something you, you know very well. But anyway, to avoid the basically gender binaries in language, the use of asterisk has been um, since, I would say the Palermo Pride was one of the big moments, yes, Silvia knows, uh, in which uh, the asterisk has been uh, used, uh, started being used. But according to Laboratorio Smascheramenti, the asterisk was invented in Bologna before that. <laughs> Someone is always reclaiming the, the origin and by uh, Alessandro Zino, and then has been used within the groups since, uh, say, 2008. And uh, so uh, the asterisk has been uh, probably the device most used by uh, queer uh, feminist communities. And uh, also the uh, ads, uh, the chiocciola, uh, has been another device to use. Um, on the, um, Asterisks, for example, um, uh, the asterisks at the moment has become probably a bit less used, but it's still very much used. But I wanted to put a word that my co-translator, Feminosk, uh, uh, put there and in describing the asterisks, why the appeal of the asterisks. She says, a star that shines at the end of a world, a blast of vowels, a grammatical anomaly that points with its fingers to the conscious omissions of all those who are not included in the uh, ideological universal neuter that is on the masculine, uh, that is on the masculine privilege. So I thought uh, it was nice to report her words that I translated into English. Another um, uh, device is the suffix U, which uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that, is being used as well um, after the asterisk, I would say, since uh, um, probably 2012 has been, uh, has been used in Rome at the beginning. I know some, some groups of friends. So I've used this as well. In 2014, I, um, I wrote a book with uh, Rachele Borgin and uh, Roger Fiorilli on the drag king phenomenon in Italy. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Drag king are um, um, people who perform masculinity on the stage, usually uh, assign women at birth, but it could be also transgender people performing masculinity. So it's a performer of masculinity rather than femininity, like the drag queens are performing femininity. Or the uh, instead, the drag king the drag kings perform uh, masculinity. In that book, we were allowed by Altera to use the U, and it was probably one of the first moments in which the U was used in a publication, which was uh, mainstream, I would say, still a um, small publishing house, a small um, book collection of the publishing house, but still, um, you know, publishing house put from Pisa, Altera. And uh, another uh, device is the Jva, that you all know from uh, the talks of Gera, Vera Gena, uh, Shun, the Jva, the single and the plural, to uh, substitute the asterisk because the Jva can be pronounced, this L, okay, instead of uh, L, okay, with asterisk can be pronounced, so Lu. <laughs> Uh, Lou has also um, uh, raised a bit of criticism because it sounds like masculine in some dialects from the south. So, Lou uh, of the E uh, of the Jva instead uh, seems to be more uh, a popular device now. So, uh, for example, if I, if I want to show you an example also, the use of Jva. Also, Laboratorio Smascheramenti, this is a uh, uh, Aprile's Famiglia queer in piazza, uh, as used the Sva here, i bimbi delle, fa i bimbe delle famiglie orcobalene. So the Sva is used more now in communication with websites of Laboratorio Smascheramenti, whereas before it was the asterisk you know, some, some time ago. Uh, Yes, yeah, in this case, uh, it's not properly applied. It's a very good question, something I wanted to say also later. It's not applied according to uh, now a dictionary and that has been produced and how to apply properly the schwa. So sometimes it's applied only at the end and it's, there's no concordance agreement with the article. Very good question, thank you. 
So I um, want to go back to the presentation. Yeah. So uh, other kind of uh, interesting example are not just the use of an in, uh, uh, inclusive language, but also the way to attack it, heteronormativity, parodying heteronormativity, making a parody, using the irony, using a lot of other um, kind of humor, uh, nicknames, wordplay. There's a lot of creativity in these groups. I tell you, if you sometimes read this communication or this manifesto, they're really, you know, full of creativity. So, um, and it's place is language to contrast the censorship. I don't know if I want to read, maybe I would uh, want to read quickly uh, some example of this. For example, this was uh, uh, a dichiarazione di indipendenza delle popole della terra storte. So terra storte means storte was used to translate queer. It was uh, done by some Movimento Nazionale in 2016 as part of some, from the, um, some kind of um, interventions in Italy and demonstrations. So um, you can see now how the use of language here is the use of language is very creative and very uh, ironic, uh, full of humor. So siamo finocchie selvatiche, femministe in erba. Trans in fiore, genuine e clandestine. Creiamo genealogie e parentele oltre la specie. Siamo trans ecologisti, resistiamo alla radioattività della famiglia nucleare. So there's a bit of a critic of uh, also monogamy here. And the family as in um, uh, the normal, in the mainstream discourse and also in the, in the right discourse. Sperimentando forme sovvertive di affetto, piacere, solidarietà, relazione. Um, siamo uh, designer e parrucchiere, stiliste e commessi, lesbiche virtuose del fai da te. Um, non mangiamo più trapani, seghi e martelli per vendere le merci del Re Merlin. So there's a critical also of um, neo, uh, say, um, uh, neoliberalism also here. So the critic also of how the system uh, include the queers, some queers that are, you know, fancy or like, like uh, fashion and kind of subsume this subjectivity into the market. And so this is a critique of that as well. Um, another interesting thing is uh, this moment, uh, let's say uh, something I wanted to... Um, Ok, con le briciole di riconoscimento concesse dall'azienda, this is a critique of the marketization also of queer identity, e dalle politiche antidiscriminatorie ci facciamo i buscottini. So you see that, you know, with the critique, they use a lot of the metaphor, metaphor of biscotti. Abbiamo comunque deciso di prenderci tutta la pasticceria, meaning we don't just want to take what you give us, we want to take all. Vogliamo tutto, this is a slogan of, of the group. And uh, uh, some of, the, of the, this experiment also use E, 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 U, siamo uscite, uscite, uscitu. So at the time there was also experimentation of, um, of that. And uh, so there is a lot of uh, interesting uh, things uh, here to look at. And uh, the word, for example, uh, froccio is a much, much uh, kind of use also in this uh, um, Mom, in this, uh, this group, so I wanted to show you if I manage uh, uh, from here. No, I don't want to uh, go out of the screen so much, but um, let, me, let me look at that so I can show you also the use of uh, um, terms like uh, Saremo a Roma perché l'eterosessualità obbligatoria è la radice comune della violenza contro le donne. So, Heterosexuality uh, compulsory again, critique of that. Uh, questo governo ha la volontà di imporre la riproduzione della nazione bianca eterosessuale, so the reproduction of white heterosexuality. There's a lot of focus also on migration in this group, of focus on uh, racialized identities. You're going to see that in the translation. And uh, other words like social, lesbian, trans, FTM, M2F, mutanti, anemoni. So, 
a lot of kind of use of words that are really also interesting. And I also use at times in the translation of the text I wanted to um, show you. Okay, so I see that I'm really going too uh, far with this. So I'm gonna give you some examples now of, uh, I didn't keep, uh, how, how much time do we have another twenty? Yeah. So uh, I want to know to show you some example, maybe a couple of, I've got prepared too many, of uh, uh, feminist, queer feminist translation project. So what do I mean by uh, translation, queer feminist translation project? I insert these projects within uh, an umbrella or within a um, kind of an IZ that is uh, translation and activism in Italy. So um, I have in Italy, but also in, uh, in other studies. So my research and uh, uh, my kind of look, uh, the perspectives I, I throw on this, uh, on this work uh, is very much informed by activism and uh, uh, studies of translation and activism. I studied with Mona Baker, who has written a book, um, Translation and Conflict in 2006. I don't know if you know her, if you studied, uh, if you start in studying translation, Mona Baker always come up as a name in translation studies. So uh, this uh, kind of, with the queer feminist translation uh, um, uh, scenario that I'm gonna look, uh, I'm gonna also present in a bit, uh, has to do with uh, uh, concepts that come from activism. We've, we've seen this group as activist groups and also from uh, feminist translation. So I'm gonna give you a couple of uh, elements from both activist translation, uh, translation and activism and feminist translation. On top of that, uh, in the last uh, um, kind of a few years, I've also looked at the notion of performativity and affect in the scenarios analyzed because there was a lot of emphasis on the performative aspect of translation and also the affect uh, aspect of them. So I'm gonna give you also a couple of uh, hints at that. So translation and activism is a, a group of studies that was born, uh, I would say in 2000 onward with the work of Timoshko, Maria Timoshko, Mona Baker and uh, Michaela Wolf. And uh, they basically recognize the fact that translation is not neutral. So it's not a neutral practice, but it's a practice that uh, um, um, entails a positioning. Uh, translators are positioned, they're not occupying a neutral space. And they uh, sometimes uh, pretend to be, we are bridging the gaps between cultures, we are, you know, um, bridges uh, between cultures, uh, yes, but you also position in a particular um, um, place and that brings you the cultures might be not exactly happening at times. So you bring your own narrative in the translation. This is what Mona Baker kept saying to us in the classes. I basically grew up academically with Mona Baker in the UK in Manchester. So uh, very much putting a lot of emphasis on translation positioning. And this is what these groups I mentioned, or some of people um, revolving around these groups do in their translations, and we'll see how they do that. And the uh, translation is also a political and transformative practice. So once you, you position yourself, you become political because you say, this is my view. This is what I want to do with the translation. The translation is not neutral. I want to bring my voice there. And then translation is also transformative because it can make a change. It can change, as we said, with the example shown, with the language uh, irony, you can change really. You can parody, but you can change. You can, you know, bring some change. Then I also draw on feminist uh, translation studies. I don't know how familiar you are with that, so mainly with the latest development of feminist translation studies. Feminist translation uh, studies were born in the 90s in Canada with the work on von Floto and other group of very few, five scholars. And they basically bring notion of feminist within translation. And uh, uh, the First works were very kind of white, middle class, 
uh, there was a feminism uh, embodied by these scholars that was not so much intersectional, not you know, including more subjectivities of feminism from outside of Canada. But with the latest works on feminist translation, we have instead an expansion of that. We have a work that really includes more subjectivity in feminist uh, scholars from around the world. We have here, for example, a collection, a book quite important by uh, Castro Nergan, written in 2017, Feminist Translation Studies, which uh, from the title, you see Ergan is uh, Turkish, is a Turkish feminist, and uh, Castro is uh, Spanish. So, you know, moving away from the Anglo-centric uh, world. But uh, so what, what do feminist translation uh, studies basically point at? The point at the fact that you are um, basically political, translation is political, as I said, in an activist uh, um, turn in translation studies, the, the fact that you can make a change. How do you do that? By using strategies, translation strategies, that are intervening on the text, on the language, but also on the paratext. So uh, the first are called micro strategy, the linguistic intervention. Changing, for example, uh, a word that is sexist with another word that is not, or using the inclusive language, because there is also queer feminism. We're gonna go to that in a second. But also with macro strategies, that means a lot more from, for example, starting from the choice of text to translate. Let's translate to uh, feminist authors of which haven't been translated. So choice, uh, selection of text is the first important point. Recovering the work of all past uh, feminists that uh, were, were published and then not published anymore. But also uh, including paratranslation uh, techniques, so paratext to this text. What do I mean by paratext? Anything that accompanies the text, so a preface, a footnotes, an afterword, an essay that can accompany and contextualize your translation, uh, glossaries of terms, interviews with members of the activist scene, the feminist scene, so anything that really can contextualize that project in a specific way that can show your positioning. Okay, that's very important. So what I mean by in the preface, as I translate, you say, I translated this in that way. I use this because so justifying your choices. You don't just read the text without an introduction. You need that in feminist translation to contextualize the work. Is that clear? Yeah, see, I know you're a bit tired. Maybe I'll give you a bit of a, <laughs> yeah, slow down a bit. But um, there's a lot of work produced. Now I'll leave this for you to have a look at. So then there's a lot of work produced, the combination Feminist translation in queer studies and queer translation. So you see, for example, from 2005, gender, sex, and translation. 2011, gender in translation. 2016, translating transgenders. All these titles, you know, bring like uh, queer and feminist studies together. Uh, queer in translation, translating the queer. And the last, uh, one of the last feminists that brings together queer. And queer and feminism is both Floto and Kamal, the handbook of translation of feminism and gender, which has sections dedicated to queer translation and, for example, the work of Latin writer translating in various languages. And there, the latest one, queer theory and translation studies. So, if you're interested in the topic, there's a long list of the last, uh, say, 15 years, in particular from 2010 onwards of works that look specifically at the translation of queer works into various languages, but it also implement ideas from feminism within that. Not necessarily all these work are also feminist, but I prefer those who have, uh, which have also a component which uh, is a feminist one. And that I wanted to say, this is my research, it's a very kind of uh, research I've done in the activism in Italy. And I've seen, for example, that it's very important to think about performativity in these translations. And there is a performative turn in translation studies in the last 10 years. So very, very recent work produced translation. 
and by Bigliazzi Marinetti and Baldo I put also myself I've been writing on this uh, uh, I should have put also the la latest one 2013 uh, 23, which I talk about also performativity and affect so performativity emphasizes the notion of agency in relation the fact that translations have an impact a very strong impact on the audience and because of that impact make you do things you know performativity is how to to make things with words with a translation I'll make you change your your mind and make you change your habits a translation can really produce a change because it's performative like language is performative and the example i've shown you before by some movimento nazionale are very performative in that sense because they play with word with metaphor with um, wordplay etc so translation produce an effect on receiver this is what douglas robinson in translation studies says. so i bring this idea because i want to see also the impacts of these translations in and how this uh, translation impact on others they impact also because they are very effective they bring uh, affect they bring emotion with this they play a lot a lot the, the translation basically the outcome of effective encounters in this group you think you hear a lot the word affect because of this translation sometimes are also collaborative works and so uh, you hear that translating becomes an effective enterprise because it brings together and uh, solidify also relationship among the members of the translation, but also kind of are contagious, this idea of affect. So they, they are um, contaminating others because the, you know, there's a sort of euphoria at times. And so you want to translate something. And so you become a, a very much involved in a translation because uh, uh, you become attached to a specific author. So there is a fact involved in that and you want to translate the author. So there is this uh, very, very strong sense. Okay, now uh, let me look at time. I, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't um, uh, do the share presentation. So I'm gonna go, yes. A second, I drink a bit of water because I'm not used to speak so so much in the UK. I have like 20 minutes uh, break and then. Okay, so uh, another few minutes of what time is it like we have another 10 minutes, even less, and then maybe if we have a question to ask. So some example of uh, uh, translation, translating the feminist anglophone works into Italian. So we have uh, from 2010, first experiment, I'm gonna move on into that. So, with, for example, texts like Judy ba uh, Alveston, Judy Jack Alveston, now Jack Alveston, uh, masculinity without men, translated in masculinity uh, since a woman. And the canon inverse is a collection of queer texts translated by Alter, again, both by Alter, this uh, series, book series by uh, ETS. And um, where translated the first, you know, probably uh, kind of books that were inserted in a discourse by Marco Pustianazzi um, and Liana Borghi, who um, um, uh, gave up, basically gave, um, started the series in 2010 and decided that uh, the first book was Masculita Senza Uomini to publish the work of queer. Uh, scholars uh, in, uh, in Italy, in particular Anglophone queer theory. So to bring queer theory into Italian, uh, based on uh, seminars they used to run every summer at Villa Fiorelli, and, um, which is not far from here. So everything happened in Tuscany, basically. So um, at the time, the, the concern was, how do we translate masculinity, masculinity in English? Masculinity, so we translate with masculinity or masculinity. And they, go, they went for masculinity because it was unveiling what is the norm, which is um, masculinity, masculinity is the norm. Masculinity would have been a performance of that masculinity. So they went with a big debate for masculinity. 
And in economy kind of also, they looked at problems as uh, uh, feminine or masculine, the gender binaries. But at the time, they didn't agree. So it was 2012. And then they decided to leave the masculine feminine. But put a footnote, this paratextual uh, device, to explain that they were unwilling to do that. But as a group, there was a lot of uh, people involved that uh, circulating around our laboratories and schieramenti decided then to use the masculine, uh, general masculine, but with uh, the dates that is then appearing on the, on the footnotes. And then the problem of translating of color, which is a recurrent term now that you're gonna see in more translations. So uh, Le Beach is a um, website that uh, is called uh, Traduzioni Militanti, uh, by Feminosca, um, uh, Ginny Dalloway, and Michaela in, uh, um, in 2015, I think. And uh, now it has uh, opened uh, its uh, collaboration with a lot of other um, translators. I took part in the translation of Emi Koyama, the Transfeminine Manifesto translated uh, uh, in 2000, 2018. You have a photo here, but you can look at the link yourself from here. So when I send you the, the slides. And, uh, and then again, we had to think about how to translate of color. Of color is, is a word that in English means any person that is not white. And has to do with queer, because queer wants to you know, include racialized is, is intersectional. So it's very much present in queer text of color, the racialized queer, et cetera. So how do you translate of color? At the time we decided from um, non bianco, non bianca. But uh, recently, uh, this is not valid, it's not a good choice anymore. And then the use of asterisk. You, we, we use the asterisk at the time for gender inclusivity. And uh, uh, we also translated Manifesto Guasta Feste, containing the book from Sarame, The Living a Feminist Life, which has been published now in Italian in 2020, uh, 22. And uh, in that case, uh, also, we had the same problem of color, non bianco, we use the same. And then we had to translate the Killjoy. So uh, Sarah Ahmed is a, a lesbian feminist, so you know can include. Uh, she's really drawing a lot from queer theory. She's a scholar from Gosmet who left the university because uh, she took part in a complaints raised by the students against sexual harassment against a professor. The, the university didn't take into account the complaints. And after three years of trying and trying, she decided to resign. And then she keeps writing about also, um, uh, you know, what is sexism at university and uh, etc. So Killjoy, she talks about the feminist Killjoy. You know, when you think about feminists, those all spoil the atmosphere. So we had to translate that word Killjoy. How do you use the, how do you translate kill the joy? So we decided for Guasta Feste, because in Sarah Ahmed, there is this scene of the feminist that ruins the party, the feminist at the, at the table, the dinner table, in, you know, in this moment of festivities, she ruins the, the, the party. And this is what the father of Sarah Ahmed used to tell her, you are a kill joy. So uh, the book has been translated now on the right hand side, you see the translation by a collective from uh, P, um, uh, translators, Marta De Pifania, Beatrice Guzmano, Serena Nain, and Roberta Granelli. So why do I give you some examples here because there's not much time, maybe a couple of examples of this and another two. They use a lot of prefaces now. So the preface of the translators include all this justification of the terms. How do we translate of color? Brown and brownness. Our, our terms are very much difficult to translate. And of color, nobody wanted to translate of color like the colore because he raised like, he had nuances of the face passes past. So uh, of color, it's not translated as the colore, but it's not even translated as non bianca. They decided to leave it in English. So to borrow the English word into Italian, in that sense. And brown and brownness, it means non-black, uh, all the, you know, the nuances of color, but it means something specific for Sarame, they decided not to translate that. And uh, they use, for example, the feminine plural 
That's another important thing. Laboratories must care. And instead of using the, uh, the Shva, use the plural. For example, siamo stati al convegno, meaning also including men as well in the conversation. So feminist plural has been used also here because Sarah Ahmed has said in her talks that she didn't want to cite scholars, male scholars in this book. So because of that, they decided to use the feminine plural for uh, gender, the, the plural, instead of the masculine plural, okay? So that's why it's a very strong, not necessarily in all parts, but in most of the book. And then uh, other things about overlapping English, like SNAP, diversity work, etc. cetera. Um, in, uh, instead of the promise of happiness by Sarah Ahmed, translated by uh, Laura Scarbonchina, there was the use of Shba. For example, in the first book, there wasn't the Shba, but in this case, the Shba was used uh, in connection with the inclusive feminine also in this book, but also the Shba in relation to specific terms like bambino or bambina, uh, or figlio, figlio. Um, so these are kind of uh, ways to circumvent gender binaries, as I said before. And these are all um, talked about in the prefaces of this translation. You see, the prefaces include all these uh, terms and include also, uh, for example, things like feeling, emotion, because Sarah Ahmed talks about a lot about affect and therefore important for that. I don't know if I have another minute for another, oh, what time is it? One minute, yeah. I can show you, for example, now the translation, just about this one by uh, Jack Alberston, L'arte Quia del Falmento, translated as, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the Quia Art of Failure, translated as L'arte Quia del Falmento, published in 2022, in which there was this idea of how do we translate queer? Shall we use queer or shall we translate it with the, to reclaim the slur? So they went to an understanding of uh, queer as also sometimes as perverso. So I translate it queer as perverso, as perversione, perversità. And like other uh, um, uh, translators, a lot of terms that are part of the uh, LGBT community in the US, for example, butch femme things, were very specific related to the history of that uh, community were not translated into Italian, okay? Butch as a masculine woman, masculine lesbian, and femme as a feminine lesbian. But there's an history around that that was too much uh, to translate. Uh, or that the boy, and there are terms that are also, you know, important and being imported also in Italian, and therefore they decided not to translate them. Okay, there's many more examples, but I'll finish, uh, I'll finish here. I wanted just to point uh, at uh, the fact that these translations, just maybe this, uh, all the translation choices are negotiated, and you see that in the preface, and the most important terms are queer of color and gender binaries. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michaela, for this journey. It was an incredible journey, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really, really dense. Lots of examples, lots of theory. Um, and I'm very happy to see students of the third year as well as students of the Magistrale, uh, because actually your talk sort of cuts across some themes I'm discussing with, with the third year students about translation theories, aren't we? Yeah. So uh, what else with the Magistrale students we're talking about? Uh, gender issues and in general, in general we're having a sort of a, a pathway, a critical pathway towards the construction of subjectivity and how can we analyze it in text. So from this viewpoint, I think that many of you might have got ideas also for your assessment, uh, especially concerning the, the representation of gender and queer identities and language. So um, I have several questions, but I would like to I ask you guys, you have questions or any other points that you would like Michaela to clarify? I think it's important. I've heard.
now it's been, uh, I understand maybe now you're just, um, you know, digesting all this material, but anything you might want to do also a comment about how, you know, translating in this sense might be very important because I mentioned some prefaces, but I know that there are afterwards interview, for example, another translation about transgender history that in translated by recently, as also interviews with Marcasciano, with the members of the activism. So there's a lot of other material this text, which I wasn't able to, there's a lot today, so I'll give you a bit of a break. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very good questions. Yes, uh, queer, as I said at the beginning, was born as, as in the genealogy of uh, North American queer, was born exactly from communities which uh, were racialized communities, where like uh, Puerto Ricans in New York, or where other migrants in, in the US, who were part, who were actually sex workers, who were um, uh, very poor or didn't make, uh, you know, didn't, didn't have good lives according to the standards. So from the beginning, there was this attention to what means to be other, other than the um, rich gay guy or the lesbian who has a family, etc. It meant immense, really what... Uh, what could, uh, could we do to also think about uh, the intersection with um, you know, race, ethnicity, and also the question of migration came in from the beginning. After that, I must say, uh, academia, as in particular ang uh, Anglo-American academia, has used the term queer in a way that has become very the theoretical and has uh, um, expanded this uh, subjectivity and this idea of uh, shall we also think about migration? Shall we be more intersectional in a way that uh, we're not anymore? Or queer theory tends to be also too uh, abstract in a sense. So this is what transfeminism is actually uh, thinking of. And transfeminism uh, born in Spain is exactly uh, reclaiming this uh, word the queer as it was the origin and that had been basically a bit uh, forgotten in various passages uh, around the world. So queer means, uh, yes, we need to also think about what it means. Uh, queer in other, in other languages, queer might be not a word I want to use in my language because there's another word, for example, um, uh, tortillera in, in Spanish, making tortilla, which is a term that refers to lesbians, for example. Or there are different words uh, uh, that are local and not necessarily claim that genealogy, but still might refer to the, the slur, might refer to the objection, etc. So in the, in the collection of a paper I published recently on translating LGBT activism around the world, I, we just looked at how many ways in which queer can be translated and non-translated at times. So uh, in Italian is used, and I didn't show an example later on with perverso, is translated in this book at times with perverso in the chain, but queer is also added there. So because the laboratory most clearly wants to reclaim that word as well as the slur as in the origin, because it has lost a bit uh, that sense in Italian. And uh, yes, so to come back to that, yes, uh, there is a lot of emphasis also in these groups on migration or racialized. So in bringing together the fights of migrant fights with the um, the queer fights. So looking at very much of the subject in these various uh, kind of identities of race, class, uh, uh, ethnicity, and uh, age, etc. I don't just uh, look at sexuality per se. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes, I also wanted to ask a question about the translation of queer. You were just mentioning it. You can drink, yeah? Yes, that's <laughs> You can drink. Um, basically, yeah, I remember in, in 2010, I think, or even before, uh, one of the first publications about queer in Italia was by Marco Pustianaz, and we were part of that. 
Uh, and we were all talking about how can we translate queer? I mean, shall we translate it? You know, the question was, shall we do it or not? Uh, how can we do it? Or should we use it as a borrowing? You know, as something which has then come into use in effect. I mean, not always, as you can see, it's still an open debate. And we also talked about, shall we put it in italics to, you know, mark the, the difference, let's say, you know, to say, okay, this is a new word. And every time you use it, in a sense, it sort of changes the meaning a little bit, like you were saying now, you know. So according to the context, this word can change. So maybe we put it in italics in a text, or you underline it while you're writing to mark the fact that it's a new word. It was in 2020, like in academic language, at least, you know, in some, uh, especially in the articles we wrote. But and, and then others said, no, no, italics. Let's just write it, you know, like the other words, you know, um, with a normal font, because, you know, it's true that maybe it might be disruptive word or it talks about disruptive subjectivities but at the same time it's coming into use so why don't we make it ours and we adapt it you know to the new context and so this is what i think this was quite a useful debate you know in terms of thinking about how to think and it's not very useful what you said so in recent translations they are translating it as perverso you said perversione i guess it's also connected to the context of the text actually and what the, the, the number of context the meanings it might um, let's say communicate or want to communicate or maybe but also queers is also much more isn't it you know and, and that he, David says you know the conjunction with my migrant identities as you said about the way in which they can be freed so I'm really you know I think it's really ongoing uh, as you demonstrated today and definitely I think we need to keep on talking and it's good that it is a collective thought, a collective reflection. We talked a lot about the role of the translator. You remember, we talked about the translating process and how important is the role of the translator. As It's quite a responsibility, I always talk about that, right? Because you're taking a decision and this decision has a big impact, not just on the readers who, you know, who are support, you're thinking of what you, uh, working and thinking of the text, but actually on the on, you have a, you contribute to shaping the cultural, let's say reception, especially in contexts like queer, and that was the thought we had at the time. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, definitely. It has to do with the translation is very, uh, very nuanced, very complex activity, and I wanted to to say it's not easy because it's not easy to take a decision that then is going to stay in place forever because uh, what I've seen and what I'm doing with this research now, I've got a lot of examples as was not able, I was not able to show today, but you see that there is a lot of differences in the way in which collectives, even parts and also the collectives, uh, translation collectives who define themselves as transfeminists make different decisions in terms of shall we translate this like that or shall we translate differently and the important thing is okay they might decide to leave words in english at times they might decide not to translate uh, specific words that very much do dagger for example with the transgender history translated left in english because it has a specific exception but what uh, makes um, what would say accommodate them as group is the fact that they all uh, justify their choices with a specific narrative okay saying exactly why they didn't because there are ways in which you can be trans feminist and translate queer not translate queer for example in the book um, by gaga feminist translated by elisa virgili she decided not to translate queer just to leave it because for her he had already that uh, uh, reclamation of the slur for uh, L'Arte Que del Farimento, it was better to sometimes use the word perverso in the Cente to reclaim that. But as long as you say that in the preface, you make yourself you know, as a translator and you justify that. And it's, a, it's still a transfeminist project because it has a narrative, a justification around that. Then sometimes I would say in the case of uh, the uh, translation of living a feminist life i've uh, translated now with uh, co-translator an anthology of writing by sarah Ahmed, which will come out we decided to translate more english words into italian not because we wanted to domesticate that but because we wanted to to be more creative in a sense that was our game so instead for example there was a word now that i would like also to ask you what you think about snap the feminist nap 
uh, the Lesbo Feminist Lab in uh, Sarah Ahmed. When you're very fed up with something, you snap. So we uh, snap in English uh, as I can show you a second slide so you, you see what I mean. And uh, just an example of what. Uh, um, so snap means this one is a very famous, a very important word in the feminist, um, uh, in the feminist production of Sarah Ahmed. So snap means when feminists can't take it anymore and they just leave the room. It's something like it has to do with like that. It's also the, the, the sound of um, a sound and not just uh, something that you, you, you break with something. So uh, all the translators, the translator of living a feminist lie decided to leave it in English because they thought it had, um, it has a lot of meanings in the text. We decided to translate it as botto. Some of us had thought about sbrocco, but sbrocco is very uh, slang. So we decided instead to go for sbotto, sbottare. And I think, why not? Why not? Also, feminist skill joy could have been left in English, but guastafest is what we thought would be also a catchy word that would be also used. And also sbottare. No? So you see that uh, not necessarily our translation is, the, is, the, you know, is less trans feminist than the other. It's simply within this group, there are various choices. Like uh, Sylvia said, queer can be translated, not translated. It's important you justify your choice according to a specific narrative you have. And this is what trans feminist uh, queer translation should do. Always add the paratext, always explain footnotes, and also add as, as, uh, um, as, you know, as much material as you want. I wanted to show you one, one last thing about, for example, STAR. This is the... Um, Azione travestita di strada rivoluzionaria is a fanzine translated by Edizione Minoritarie that talks about the Stonewall movement, the birth of the LGBT movement in the US. was translated now with the addition of a lot of other texts. So this is not just a translation, it's an adaptation of that work. All these texts you see are just addition in the translation. They didn't exist in the fanzine, the original fanzine. There are essay, position in essay, and there's a lot of, uh, for example, uh, Maricona, Rinunciare alla Sicurezza. There's an essay written by migrants in Italy, migrants, sex workers, uh, queers that, you know, had shared experiences with the STAR. STAR was a house that uh, gave uh, uh, refuge to uh, LGBT people who were thrown out from, from their families and didn't have anything to, they were on the streets. And so that they wanted to do something as well with the book and, and they did a, a campaign as well with the book to support the sex workers in Italy during the COVID. So you see translation is really entering a project that is very performative, wants to, to do also things in this case also for sex workers and migrants. But add a lot more and it done more you contextualize the project. If you use the queer or don't use the queer in that extra text, you understand why, okay? It's not just a preface, it's much more than that. Yeah, sorry, I just took a... <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Plego.
thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, Thank you for the question. Yeah, this is a debate, a big, big debate uh, um, in translation studies. Shall we maintain the nuances of the source text or shall we try to uh, find equivalence? At times they're not equivalent, so they're not most of the time you lose in translation something. So definitely uh, this is also some partially the view that I've seen in some of these collectives. What we did with translating SNAP was also added a lot, of course. We didn't think that just the translation was sufficient. So we added a note explaining why we came to the decision, and we said that in the preface as well of the translators, why we came to that decision. And uh, in a lot of other translation I've seen, there's a tendency to leave terms, like for example, transgender now, is not translated as transgender, and in Italian it's transgender. It's left because it's a word that has entered already the communities, etc. For all the words, you know, we made a decision to uh, give something that was catchers in Italian. Leaving Killjoy in English would have not been so catchy. I think Master Fest may became something you can relay more to, uh, to the environment you live. So there's also that, that question. There is a combination of both, I would say. And so what you said, certainly, if we decide not to translate anything, there was no translation anymore. So we need also to compromise between what we would like to introduce, because at some point, then the world becomes uh, uh, certainly it's never the same. So the world becomes uh, attached to other affectivity, etc. It becomes an important word. So having the sound in Italian might be important at times to uh, for the start of a new means that I will get a chat to the world. It's very easy to say, okay, now we, the world doesn't have the nuances of the English one, but we will have all the nuances when it, it starts circulating in Italian, because for example, Guasta Feste was used by Campo Agape to organize the seminars, feminist seminars, and they call the workshops of Guasta Feste. So they borrow words from the translations. A lot of these collectives organize demonstration of the borrowers that have been used in the translation. So this translation are not just uh, kept in the shelves. They're used very much. And I think sometimes an Italian catchy word for, um, for uh, it's, it's important. That's why you need to force yourself a bit and be creative. But then there is sometimes, of course, also um, there are obstacles. And you think, OK, shall I use bulldogger here? I would have really to think about, you know, Bulldog is a lesbian, masculine lesbian. Shall I use camionara? Shall I use, no, maybe no, it's got the derogative meaning in Italian. That is not really exactly. I leave Bulldogger with a footnote, fine. And I, so it's okay. But then in other cases, it might be uh, also worth trying to get because it's a concept so much repeated that at some point, maybe to have that kind of sound in Italian might be, might be important. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, well, I teach my students a course, uh, Multimodal Translation, which is the title, and I look at Fun Subbers. I don't know if you know this. Yeah, Fun Subbers are a group of uh, uh, subtitlers that translate uh, uh, series for fun and for uh, the you know, network of all the uh, people are interested in that series. They start, started already many years ago. So they use techniques that uh, associate a bit of the footnote in written, in written text in the subtitling um, uh, practice. For example, adding an explanation on top of the screen that stays for many, for many uh, screenshots, or for many uh, scenes uh, after the six seconds of the normal subtitling, uh, subtitles uh, time. So they use that at times, uh, they use pictorial subtitles, moving subtitles. So, uh, there is a way to recreate maybe that creativity by using a bit of uh, these techniques, uh, moving all the subtitles around the screen, not so much just at the bottom, but maybe on top, 
on the side. I know this disrupts maybe the viewing, the viewer attention, you know, and you have only six seconds to read the two lines of subtitles. You're constrained, but if you leave this explanation, if you leave something a bit longer for scenes that are not related necessarily or might be related to each other, although you're not translating that speech. There are, you know, ways to overcome that, but I know it's a very big constraint. Subtitling is a constraint, so you just, yeah. 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 Well, I would suggest, you know, years ago when I was in Siena, I did an uh, um, uh, edited collection of paper with Garzelli on subtitling and intercultural communication. And there's a paper on that collection, it's, uh, it's been uh, published in 2014, this uh, collection of paper by David Catton, who talks exactly about how to be creative in the subtitle. So he makes some examples in which you can force uh, the subtitle without, you know, using the fast subtitle techniques. And so maybe that could be something to read about, but yeah, definitely is, is a constraint. So it goes for creativity and try really to find the word, you, know, you have to be, you know, constrained. So that word that can refer to a lot of things, so a lot of creativity, but it makes a lot of example in that paper that are interesting. So if you, it's called Subtitling and Intercultural Communication. It's been published here in, uh, in Siena, yeah. Okay, so I, I guess it's about time also. So thank you so much, Michaela. I, I think we all together can say thank you. And the recording of the seminar will be available for you to look at again. And also I think the slides, right? Michaela, I'm gonna share them with the students. Thank you.